Give them joys that never end. Amen. That was beautiful. Wasn't that sweet? In our sequence today. This weekend is the last weekend before their summer break for our choir. And we're going to really miss you. Aren't we? I love this feast day. Lord, send out your spirit and renew the face of the earth. How does that work? We're going to talk about that at the end. But first, why this particular gospel? It's not a Pentecost reading. It doesn't talk about Pentecost Sunday, but rather we're told at the beginning of the gospel that it was that first day of the week, that same day that Mary Magdalene, Peter, and John ran to the tomb and found it empty. It was Easter Sunday. Now, none of the Gospels have an account of Pentecost, but this reading is chosen because of its reference to the Holy Spirit, but not just because it mentions the Holy Spirit, but as our catechism in paragraph 732 states, on Pentecost, on this, I'm getting ahead of myself, anyway. It's not, it refers to the Holy Spirit, but not just the Holy Spirit, but the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is it. Paragraph 732. It states that on Pentecost, the fullness, the fullness of the Holy Trinity is revealed. And it comes in power. It's interesting that on that first Sunday of Easter, that Jesus breathes on the apostles, giving them the first taste of the Holy Spirit to give them a particular power, the power to forgive and to retain sins, the sacrament of reconciliation. And I find this fascinating, that even though the mission of the church has not yet begun, it won't begin until this day on Pentecost, that Jesus deemed it necessary, important, significant, that that church between Easter Sunday and Pentecost would have two sacraments that they would be celebrating. And they are the Eucharist and reconciliation. That's how important these sacraments are to us as a church, to our pilgrimage. They sustain us. They keep us alive. The Eucharist and reconciliation. In this particular gospel, on Easter Sunday, St. Cyril of Jerusalem will tell us that it is a foreshadowing, an anticipation of Pentecost. It is the first outpouring of the Holy Spirit that points to an even greater outpouring of the Spirit at the day when the church would be born. We get our details about this feast day from the Acts of the Apostles, our first reading today. And there are a number of things that jump out at us that are, that are wonderful to reflect on. I would encourage you to meditate on these. One of them, and I mentioned it in my column, so I'm not going to talk about it, is that they spoke in tongues. They were really gifted in The second thing that we can meditate on in today's first reading is this. What is Pentecost? What does it mean? What are the symbols involved? What would have meant to Jesus' contemporaries, first century Jews? And third, why does the Holy Spirit come down on the apostles as tongues of fire? When Jesus came out of the River Jordan in his baptism, the Spirit came down on him in the, in the form of a dove. We know in other parts of Scripture, the Spirit comes as the glory cloud. Why tongues of fire on Pentecost Sunday? We'll get to that. So let's jump into Pentecost first. Pentecost comes from the Greek word Pentecoste, a name, a word that means 50th. It's the 50th day after the Passover. For the Jewish people, the feast was called the Feast 
of Shabbat. Shabbat. It was the Feast of the Weeks, the seven sevens. Seven times seven is 49. 49 days leading up to that vigil and that day of Pentecost, the 50th day. Both Passover, Easter, and Pentecost originated as harvest feasts. In Passover, they would offer the first sheaths, the first offerings of the fruit barley, the barley wheat. They would make unleavened bread and offer that to God. We have a little bit of a reminiscent of this on, on uh, Holy Saturday when people bring their Easter baskets to the church. And they often bring bread, and some people give the priests some bread. That's what they did in the Old Testament. They would bring bread, and the priests would get to eat the bread. It's a way to support the priesthood. But we have a remnant of that. But it was the unleavened bread that was offered on Passover. And unleavened bread was considered to be pure bread. It hadn't been touched by yeast. If you know how yeast works, it was pure bread. And we know that on Passover, the true bread from heaven, that pure bread, our Lord Jesus Christ offered himself to the Father for us. Fifty days later, the Jewish people in the second harvest festival of the season would bring the wheat offering, the sheaves of wheat, and they would bring leaven, uh, leaven bread, loaves of bread, and they would offer that to God, bread that had been touched by yeast, but it would be offered to God to be purified as the first fruits of that harvest. And in the church's eyes, this always became an interesting reflection on how the first fruit is Jesus Christ on Pentecost, on Easter Sunday, and the second offering is the people of God filled with the Spirit of God, the loaves broken in the world, continuing the mission of Christ. These were both memory feasts also. In Passover, they would remember what God had done, had saved them from bondage in Egypt by the blood of the Lamb. Of course, we know how Jesus fulfills that. He is the true Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then 50 days later, after being set free from Egypt, they found themselves at the foot of Mount Sinai. And it was here that God would give them the law, the Ten Commandments. And on Pentecost, the prophecies are fulfilled. God no longer gives his law written on stone tablets, but through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, he writes that law in our hearts. The fulfillment of the prophets. And the Spirit came down upon them like tongues of fire. Why? Because it was Pentecost. How did the Lord come down on Mount Sinai? We're told that the mountain was wreathed in smoke because God came down into their midst as fire. And so on Pentecost Sunday, God again comes down upon his church, down upon Mount, Mount Zion now, and sets them on fire. Lord, send out your spirit and renew the face of the earth. How does this happen? It doesn't happen apart from you. The Lord sends down his spirit upon his church, and it's through his church that he continues his mission in the world today. It's through his church, his mystical body, you, that he renews the face of the earth. You are drawn in to the very ministry of Christ. You are a royal priesthood, offering a spiritual sacrifice through your bodies. We are a pilgrim people, working in this world, and yet our hearts are set on heaven. A people of prayer, that even though we labor in this world, our heads, our minds, our hearts are with the Lord, for we have lifted them up to him. We find ourselves in the presence of God, and yet we labor in the world to bring his mission to completion. We pray 
as if it all depended on God. And we work here below as if it all depended on us because he's counting on us, but not through our own power. Each of us is gifted, St. Paul says in our second reading today, given different gifts from the same Spirit, gifts to benefit or as some translations say, gifts given for the common good. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit that we are to accomplish God's work in the world around us. Remember what Jesus told us. You will do greater works than these, than the works that he did, because I go to my Father. And when he goes to the Father, he sends his Spirit, a Spirit of power into our midst. The apostles didn't go out of that upper room having received the Holy Spirit and speak the many languages of the world to show off. But that gift was given to them for the common good, for the continuing mission of Christ, that all nations may hear the truth. And he continues to do that today. The challenge we looked at in our question of the week, as we celebrate this Pentecost, the birth of the church and its continuing mission, what will I do? What commitment will I make to continue the mission of Christ? May I suggest that we stop putting limits to what God can do in and through us, that we get out of the way, that as a people of prayer, we open ourselves in humility as contrasted with the pride of those before the fall of the Tower of Babel. That in humility we know that it is God accomplishing his works through his church. Yes, no doubt. Pentecost is the birthday of the church. But the church is you. It is the birthday of the continuing mission of Christ through you. Let us get out of the way. Let us ask the Lord, Lord, whatever you ask of me, I will do. Lead me. Show me the way. So that the psalmist, psalm, so that the psalm that we sung may be truly ours. Lord, send out your spirit and renew the face of the earth, not by my power, but by your power, your will be done. 